for the next. I hope I'm audible. So I'm going to start this by, I'm not going to bore you with um, observational data. I'm going to start this uh, with a case, the real case, my patient. And in between, I will flash up the questions which we as doctors ask ourselves and patients' questions, the commonly asked. Cannot cover everything, but I'll try my best to cover some of the salient points. So this is the financial disclosure. Oh, oh. Uh, this is not my presentation. Uh, sorry, this is not my presentation. Can I put it here? I've got it with me. So this is the, the previous slide was all about observation studies, which I fell off to sleep, so I'm going through it. So this is a real patient. So this is a lady, 63 years old, diabetes, since you can see here. These are the problems that she has, hypertension, almost everybody, almost everybody has got NFLD, there was a suggestion of a TIA. So these are her figures, so BMI is 34, blood pressure is slightly over target and these are the medications that she was on. You can see she's on full dose of, almost full dose of sulfonylurea, um, SGLT2, metformin, premix insulin three times a day. I'm not a great fan of thrice daily premix, so she was on 106 units of insulin when she first came. So her question was, Dr. Sir, which took her here? I said, you're worried about weight. Nanny, get the blood sugar down. Three times I'm injecting regularly, 106 units. Do something about my sugar. Weight is, was secondary for her. So the first thing I asked, I'll show me your reports. When she showed me the reports, she started with the sugar report. Oh, no. And this is how I trained myself as well. I said, no, I want to see your lipid profile reports first. So the lipids, so LDL was 130. And she's on a curve set in 20 milligrams. First diagnosis is not taking. Anybody having 20 milligrams of adverse setting should have a better LDL. So if you ask the question, are you taking the medications? The answer would be yes, yes. The question is, how many times have you missed it? Then the correct answer will come. Then she said, yes, I'm missing it. So first thing, correct the LDL. So this you must take regularly. Second, blood pressure. That we have to correct if she has not been taking this regularly. Third, lifestyle change. So after all of this, then I will look at the blood sugar reports. So here we need to improve her glycemic control, weight, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and I'll come to that in a minute. So she's already on SGLT2. So what is the data we have? So I tell the GLP-1 companies, don't fight with SGLT2. SGLT2 inhibitors have become the standard of care. So don't fight with it. It is on top of that. So if I add GLP1 with SGLT2, what will be the impact on HB1C, on weight, and on blood pressure? It is very interesting actually. So here if you see, this is GLP1 causing 
H B on C reduction. This is H zero to two causing H B on C reduction. If you add this plus this is equal to three, but actually H B on C drop is two. So everywhere, if you see less than addition, if you add this, it comes here, but actually it is there. So two plus two is not four; it is three. So that is true for any drug combination in diabetes. The combination will not add up. So HP1C drop is less than addition. Now, how about the other, the body weight? And this is interesting. If you see, this is the additive body weight, and this is the actual. Merely additive. Only one equals less than additive. One equals more than additive. So the HP1C drop is less than additive, but the weight loss is two plus two four. So how about the blood pressure? Because we forget that TLP1 receptor agonists also drop blood pressure significantly. Here again, you see this is the blood pressure drop additive, and this is the actual. So it is more than additive. So your HB1C drop is less than additive, but it is more than the single agent. Your weight loss is the same, and your blood pressure drop might be more than additive. So which is the help for this patient? A blood pressure was likely. Now, if you look at the, we don't have data of GLP-1 plus HGLP-2 uh, mace. This is data taken from the various trials. So this is GLP-1 receptor agonist. This is HGLP-2, and this is the combination. So if you see here, the combination, the three-point mace, seems to be holding when you combine. But the heart failure. But there were some doubts about the GLP-1 receptor agonists in heart failure. What was surprising was, this is with GLP-1, this is with SGLP-2, the combination seems to do better as far as heart failure. My personal thought process is this, that the GLP-1s have a good effect on the hep -fep rather than hep -fep. We can discuss that later in the question and answer if you want. Now, questions which the patient will ask, and I will ask, now patient is having diabetes for 30 years, she is on 106 units, and HP1C is more than 9%, will adding semaglutide help the HP1C? Do you have any evidence? So there is a clear evidence in, in pioneer age, more than 700 patients with diabetes on insulin, roughly mean dose was about more than 50 units of insulin. An HB1C between 7 to 9.5. More than 15 units insulin, HB1C not under control, you add some amplitude. Do we still get improvement in HB1C? The answer is yes. You get up to 1.3% improvement in HB1C and you drop about more than 3.5 kilograms in weight. And the insulin dose is reduced by 20%. So for this patient, this will perfectly fit the bill. So I want to get her HB1C down, it will make her happy. I will get the insulin dose down, which will make her happy. And I will get the weight down, which will make me happy. So I started her on oral semaglutide, 3 milligrams. Now this is the chart, I don't know if you can see it properly. So I have increased it 3, 7 and then 14. So the sugar levels began to come down nicely here. So the patient said, of Dinwa Leram Kustokari is for Dovar Melaye. So 106 units of premix he was taking. So I changed it to twice a day co formulation rhizobium. Now 106 units, I reduced it to about 70 units. With that, this is classical. Initially, the blood sugar goes up. With that, Diglutek trying to kick in. So once it kicks in, then it began to come down nicely. So at the end, what would happen was, at follow up, so roughly about three or four months, the HB1C had dropped, still not ideal, but at least it is 1.4% drop. Her sugar levels had dropped, weight had dropped by about five kilograms, blood pressure was better, LDL, no credit to GLP1 is a pregnancy, so she just started to take that robustatin and then. So the other question is, it's a costly medicine, Achha, Dr. Saab, ye ban karne par weight gain ho jayega, kya se? Answer is haan, ho but I wanted to dig data. Kitne din tak we can keep the weight down. So the longest one which I could get 
was the step four trial. This was not done in patients with diabetes, this was done in patients with obesity, but half of them were pre-diabetic. So this is very interesting data. Patients were given subcut semaglutide up to 2.4. Here, at 20 weeks, patients is on 2.4. Now, one group, you continue 2.4 milligram once weekly, for another 40 weeks, other group, you stop it and just give placebo. So then, what we want to see is, ye weight loss, jo is yaha par hua tha, kitne din baad mujhe gain ho raha hai. Aur weight loss jo yaha par hua tha, with this continuation, will there be further weight loss? This is a question asked by the patients and doctors alike. Ki mene diya, ki ti mene mein jo weight loss hona ho gaya, uske baad nahi hoga. Is this true? So here you see, up to here, the sigma glutide was given. And, and for this group, it was stopped. So you see here, the weight has started to go up. But even at 68 weeks, that is 40 weeks after stopping, 40 weeks after stopping, so almost 10 months after stopping, the weight is actually still less than when the patients began. So up to 40 weeks, weight pakrar. And if you continue it, there is further weight loss up to here. Up to 52 weeks, there is further weight loss. At 52 weeks, it begins to plateau. So what it tells, this may not be 100% true for diabetes, but half of them may be diabetic. So this is what I tell my patients. Aap lete raho, to aapka weight loss aur bhi hota rahe. Band karne ke baad, 6 se 10 mahine tak, you will, um, have, your weight will actually still be less than what you started with. And this is the same with the weight circumference. The weight circumference goes down, stabilizes here, it begins to go up. But still at, here you can see 68 weeks, it is still less than what the patient started with. So here it is, so here at 68 weeks, more than 5% weight loss, 90%. But those who stop the semaglutide, after 40 weeks of stopping, still 50% had more than 5% weight loss. The previous speaker was speaking about 5% weight loss being one of the markers that you have achieved something. So here, half of the patients after stopping 40 weeks. So one important question which was asked by our esteemed delegate here, a very important question. Because of weight loss, I have lost muscle mass and I have become weak. So this is a question asked by some of the patients, particularly those on SGLT2 inhibitors. Mind you, the benefits of SGLT2 inhibitors is very good, but I'm sure you must have also come across weight loss weight loss So I tried to delve a little bit deeper. This is one of the best papers that you can go through in cells 2021. What they suggested that Emerging new data indicate that treatment with SGLT2 may contribute to the reduction of skeletal muscle index and skeletal muscle mass. And therefore, they will consider limiting the SGLT2 in elderly patients with sarcopenia. Mind you, SGLT2 inhibitors work very well for elderly also. It also reduces their mobility and mortality. But the sarcopenia problem, muscle mass, might be there for a small proportion of patients. So I try to delve a little bit deeper. Q, why? So here you see, this is something called intermuscular adipose tissue. This is very, very important. So this is a young person with normal BMI. You can see this is the muscle MRI. There's a little fat in between. But this is a person with obesity. Look at the fat in between the muscles. Lot of fat. So what does it do? You see, the problem is, you've got this fat in between the muscle cells. This fat also undergoes inflammation. Body ka fat reserve exceed ho gaya, that excess fat will cause inflammation, wherever it is. So in the muscle also it causes inflammation. And this inflammation will damage the surrounding muscles, sarcopenia. And the GLP-1 receptor agonists work very well, <coughs> very well on the inflammation in the inflammatory pathway. So it might reduce this inflammation. Do we have evidence that it reduces? So I'll show, I'll show you through that to you. So problem is the intermuscular adipose tissue, intramuscular rather, adipose tissue, here it is very difficult to measure otherwise because all the inflammation, the free fatty acids coming out and destroying it, you won't get any evidence in the blood, 
ब्लड स्ट्रीम बिकॉज इट इज ऑल वेरी लोकलाइज आपको कोई खून का जांच नहीं है जो बता सकेगा कि ये हो रहा है अंदर मसल के अंदर सो दिस इज सबक्यूटिनियस एरिपोस टिश्यू दिस इज विसर एरिपोस टिश्यू वी आर वेरी फोकस ऑन विसर एरिपोस टिश्यू दिस इज इंटरमस्कुलर एरिपोस टिश्यू नाउ सी हियर इंटरमस्कुलर एरिपोस टिश्यू सिग्निफिकेंटली हायर कैपेसिटी देन सबक्यूटिनियस एरिपोस टिश्यू ऑलमोस्ट द सेम एज विसर एरिपोस टिश्यू इट इज एज इंपॉर्टेंट इफ नॉट मोर and if you see here all these inflammatory cytokines chemokines everything it is significantly higher than both subcutaneous and visceral adipose tissue all of these together so this is an important area which we we are missing out and more research is now guided towards this so there is now emerging data in animal studies at least that it can reduce the muscle wasting by reducing this inflammation in the muscle so there is this is a very interesting data this is the normal control mice this is the high fat diet fed mice and this is the high fat diet plus semaglutide now if you see the fat normal control very little fat in the muscle high fat diet lot of fat in the muscle high fat diet plus semaglutide very little fat now as compared to this so this is interesting and thinking back i cannot recall a single patient on glp1 not only semaglutide dulaglutide liraglutide not a single patient i can recollect who said ki mere ko kamzori ho raha but i can recall several patients who there is glp2 dola kamzori ho raha so the other question commonly asked is actually data with the subcut semaglutide is subcut semaglutide and oral semaglutide is the effect the same So this is um, a single center retrospective observational study for done in Croatia. Patients were GLP-1 naive. They were started. One group was started on semaglutide one milligram. Other group was started on 14 milligrams of oral semaglutide. So subcut versus oral. <coughs> Now this is not an RCT. This is an observational study. So there are pro pros and cons to both. So there, what they found was this. that the age bound c drop was similar the weight loss was similar so this is the first proof actually that the subcut and the oral semaglutide the effect is same now there are multiple real world um, studies across the world now you can see here a um, lot of some are completed uh, results some are out some are not yet out um, real world uh, data from canada suggest drop of hbnc 1% weight loss about 7 kg from switzerland 0.9% and uh, weight loss of about 5 kg and you've got the pioneer india data which is ongoing and here 90% were started for better glycemic and weight control the hbnc was 8.9% when it was started one in two person had cbd related history and 20% were started within one year of diagnosis so we will wait uh, for these results to come in so i think for my patient i was happy that 5 years ago i could not do anything rather uh, apart from just keeping on increasing the insulin dose so now i have got an agent which will not only reduce the insulin dose requirement but get the hbonc down without increasing the hypoglycemia and also at the same time get the weight down i have not shown you for lack of time the data on non alcoholic fatty liver disease so thank you very much for your kindness